Hello, my name is Lark Kelsey, and I'd like to share with you what I've learned about how to recover from the painful effects of misapplied spiritual teachings. When believers experience pain and disillusionment, trying to hold on to what they've been taught about Jesus and Jesus himself, they can experience a crisis of faith where they feel like they have to jettison them both in order to find healing. I want to show how we can carefully detangle from those harmful teachings and find healing in Christ. Since this is such a broad topic, I just want to choose one area of harmful teaching, the impacts of evangelical purity culture on women. So as a content warning, I do want to give you a heads up that part of my teaching today will include a discussion of sexual assault. With that said, I want to approach this entire topic in a way that I believe has the potential to be healing and transformative. And since it can be a tough topic, I'd like to begin with a little bit of humor. This is a meme that illustrates a point I'd like to make regarding the importance of the personal study of God's word. Here you can see many people are trying to get a shot at photographing the famous Mona Lisa. However, the crowds are making it challenging for this person to get up close, and they have settled for a picture of someone else's picture. And like the top, text at the top indicates, it's a similar error if you read a lot about God, but you never study the Bible for yourself. You're depending on others to do the work for you, and you're susceptible to repeating their errors. Many of us know the feeling of being new in our faith, whether we came uh, to faith in a church growing up or to Jesus later on in life. There's a humility in realizing we don't know everything, and it's really easy to rely on other people around us because they seem like they know what they're talking about. There's a precious trust that we bestow on the people who we choose to teach us. The New Testament letters are filled with warnings against false teachers. And Paul warned the Galatians not to simply accept false teaching, even if it were coming from Paul himself. So how are we to know what teaching is true and what teaching is false? I think the answer lies in cultivating discernment. And as a devotional, I'd like to take a look at Acts 17, 11. Here we see a group of people who are commended for not just taking Paul at his word, these believers received his teaching, but then compared it with the scriptures. Another important part of this passage is that they were doing it together as a community. So if a group of people get together and come to an agreement, it's probably better than one person doing it on their own. Not always. Scripture has something to say about that too. Proverbs 26, four through five, says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So which is it? It's both. The problem and the beauty of scripture is that it leaves room for both of these to be acceptable responses to a fool, depending on the context. The book of Proverbs and scripture as a whole is not giving us just a simple set of rules to follow, but a person to imitate. We are called to become conformed to the image of Christ. But alone, we lack the ability to see our own blind spots, so we need others around us to help us. In my house, it's often said, great minds think alike. But my daughter likes to add, fools seldom differ. Her point is that groups can become single-minded in their errors. This is why I think we need to study God's word together in a diverse community, not just with those who think like us. And so, as an example of the problems that can occur with homogenous groupthink, I'd like to begin a discussion of evangelical purity culture and its impacts on Christian women. At its core, the purity culture began with a call for young people to pursue purity in sexual relationships. This is not a bad thing in and of itself, but it does become a problem when it becomes more important than calling youth to pursue God. The desire for this call to purity came as a reaction to the sexual revolution of the 60s. As many parents of that time grew up and had kids of their own, they began to look for ways to help their children turn to God's ethic for sex instead of the cultures. What began as a Southern Baptist curriculum called True Love Waits turned into an evangelical Christian subculture. Purity culture became an industry consisting of books, teachings, conferences, rallies. It encouraged ceremonies like rites of passage and purity balls and purity rings. 
If you've been in evangelical culture in the US, I'm sure you've seen this happen. A book or something gets popular and then everyone you know is reading it. Then there's matching devotionals, the study curriculum, the conferences, the merch. It becomes a huge money maker. And once something gets big, makes money, and on the surface it looks like it has a good objective, it begins to resist any critique and becomes hard to stop. These good intentions became focused on outward obedience instead of inward change. Combined with methods that relied on fear, shame, and the prosperity gospel, this has produced disastrous results, especially for women, both in the church and outside of it. And to aid in the illustrating how this happens, I'd like to show a little bit of my personal experience. As I began studying this topic, I joked that I feel like I'm literally a poster child for purity culture. Here's my true love weights card. While many people experience purity culture as an extension of their parents' teaching, for me, it was something I sought out on my own. I didn't grow up in an evangelical home, but a friend invited me to a true love weights rally a few months after I committed my life to the Lord. I really resonated with the message the speaker gave, and I made a commitment to abstinence. And here is the article that was written about a True Love Waits rally coming to our city. As newlyweds, my husband and I were interviewed and asked about our commitment to abstinence before marriage. We didn't go into detail about how we really were just technically virgins. Although we had committed to saving our first kips on the lips for our wedding day, that commitment had not made us any more mature, more pure, or able to avoid other forms of sexual intimacy. Next, I want to turn to some of the themes of purity culture. And to keep this short, I need to paint in broad strokes. So please know there's a lot of nuance I'm unable to give here. If you're interested in this or any research, um, you can reference my bibliography at the end. Amanda Ortiz very helpfully studied and created a measure of purity culture and found these common themes. First, she noted that men and women are subject to double standards when it comes to sexuality. In general, it's considered appropriate that male behavior is less regulated than female behavior. Second is the idea that women are considered the sexual gatekeepers and that they have a responsibility to limit their own and their partner's sexual expression. This is a related application of the third theme, that men are unable to control their sexual desire. Because of a faulty understanding of male sexual desire, it was thought that men needed help from women to rein them in. And this is what leads to further pressure of women in the fourth theme, extreme modesty. This put pressure on women to dress in a manner that wouldn't cause a brother in Christ to stumble. Phrases like modest is hottest are often heard within the purity culture and specific recommendations against things like two-piece bathing suits, spaghetti straps, and yoga are frequently mentioned. Next, virginity was described as the greatest gift you could give your spouse, and so sexuality became commoditized. This easily led to an association of value. If you had your virginity intact, you were worth more. Non-virgins were regularly compared to damaged goods, such as chipped teacups, stained napkins, or manhandled roses. Ortiz also notes the influence of evangelical cultural messages regarding gender, where women are considered the weaker sex and must be protected, adored, and supported by men. Unlike hostile sexism, this kind of benevolent sexism is not displayed in overly contemptuous attitudes. Specifically within purity culture, there's an emphasis on the father-daughter relationship and a sort of protective paternalism. As a woman's virginity was seen as precious, specifically the father was in charge of protecting her and her care was transferred over to the hands of her husband on their wedding day. She notes that this benevolent sexism is more subtle than hostile sexism, but it also is a form of prejudice and has been shown to promote gender inequality. Lastly, there's an all or nothing mentality when it comes to sexuality. Within purity culture, there were no steps considered too far to guard against sexual impurity. This is derived from a slippery slope mentality that can only see danger coming from one direction. So the application was don't just save sex for marriage, but any kissing. Side hugs could lead to babies if you didn't watch it. As a summary, purity culture had two main errors. The first was unequal application and specific pressure on women. Is it wrong for us to consider what we wear? No, 
Each of us is called to do all things to the glory of God and consider the weaker believers among us. Is it bad to mention that there are differences between men and women in their tendencies regarding sexuality? No, but we should also explain that each person must carry their own load and is responsible for personal self-control. Is it wrong for parents to encourage their children to follow a sexual ethic they believe is in line with scripture? Certainly not. But is the lack of mother-son purity balls something that should give us pause to consider where the attention's really to train up a child in the way they should go or something else entirely? The second error were the methods used. Specifically, the use of scripture to justify this is particularly abhorrent, and I postulate that this abuse is what's contributing to how women emerging from this harm may exhibit symptoms of religious trauma. The unspoken shame and fear-based approaches also are so contrary to the gospel, and keeping your virginity intact is not the ticket to a happy life. So what impact had these misapplied spiritual teachings caused? First, a lack of discernment leads to creating legalistic, one-size-all-fits rules. Another effect is that women who have been sexually assaulted can end up believing that they are responsible. Because women were to be the gatekeepers, they might blame themselves for not resisting more strongly or being too tempting for their partner. It's also led to the objectification of women. When you value a person based on their virginity or their purity, you devalue them as image bearers. This leads to women being seen as objects, not people, things to be used, not daughters of the king. And unfortunately, this misses the entire narrative arc of scripture. We have creation, the fall, redemption, and consummation. Yet purity culture focuses on using shame in order to get people to obey. God wants our obedience to come from love, not out of fear. It also leads to an unhealthy teaching of marital sex. Before you're married, your purity is based on your virginity. But once you get married, what happens to it then? When you're married, that man still has the uncontrollable sex drive. And so now as a wife, books have continued to teach that women are supposed to make sure that they are available to him at any time, or it might be your fault if he seeks sexual fulfillment elsewhere. So now that we've looked at the painful effects, I wanna to turn to something more hopeful, how we can, as ministers of the gospel, promote healing from harmful teaching, beginning with general ways that all of us can help and then I want to close with some specific situations for helping women who are experiencing this kind of pain in particular. It seems logical to assume that if there's been bad teaching, then the remedy would be good teaching. And in many cases, it is necessary to recognize the problems in what has been taught, to rebuke those and reform them. One of my main goals in this presentation is to bring awareness to how these teachings have harmed women. However, we can't just become the new experts that others can continue to rely on because we will have our own deficiencies. We need to cultivate theological humility and discernment for ourselves, as well as encourage the people we minister to do the same. It's important that we see both the good and the bad in religious teaching and detangle them. We need to be people learning together in diverse community, listening to critical feedback. Many heretical teachings and conflicts in church history have derived from the struggle to make something clear that scripture's not very clear on. It's reasonable to decide on a personal conviction, but then refuse to recommend that as a one-size-fits-all example for others to follow. This is where interacting with diverse community is important. We need to be aware of the spectrum of beliefs that Christians have on different topics and respect the theological processes that led them to their conclusions, even if we disagree with them. Particularly in cases of religious trauma, we need to resist becoming the new authority for someone else to trust. It's important for us as ministers to remind people that they have the same Holy Spirit as we do and to encourage them to pursue the Lord on areas where there are differences on the practical application of scripture. So when you are ministering to a woman who is experiencing pain because of spiritual teaching, the first thing that you can do is recognize and validate its traumatic impacts. So 
Survivors of purity culture experience a variety of mental health issues, reporting mild anxiety to full-blown symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. A cautious minister will care for a woman similarly as they would someone recovering from a traumatic event. Another thing that's necessary is reassurance. Those dealing with religious trauma have often come to doubt themselves, and women need reassurance in safe places to process these feelings of disillusionment, anger, and grief. Counseling from a licensed professional is an invaluable source of care for a woman detangling from harmful teachings. And lastly, group support. Listening to the experiences of others in a support group can be very helpful. Some women may not be able to link all the problems that they're having with the harmful teaching that they absorbed, but hearing another woman's experience can give just enough distance for them to be able to connect the dots in their own lives. These teachings impact identity formation at its core, so the mind will resist anything that challenges a change. These teachings also tend to cause victims to blame themselves, so a group setting can help women who want to extend compassion towards someone else learn how to give compassion to themselves also. Others who do recognize the harm in these teachings have been benefited by the space to process through these specific events and receive care from others. In closing, I want to affirm that I value teaching regarding to sexual ethics, and I believe it's important for us to consider. I'm also truly thankful for the good intentions behind purity culture. Although I grieve the emotional baggage that I now need to unpack because of it, I can acknowledge that had I gone down a different path, I would probably be unpacking different baggage. I don't regret to committing to abstinence before marriage, but I look around and I see how the purity culture consequences have been instrumental in the collapse of faith for many people. I want to help others avoid this pain and trauma. Critiquing the methods is not the same as critiquing the intent. And pointing out the harm that it has been done will enable us to learn from our mistakes and communicate more clearly for future generations.